Hello and welcome to the Virtual Shakespeare Reading Group and today I'll be discussing Hamlet's Act 1, Scene 1 and this is a fantastic opening to a play. It's riddled with tension and fear. It's midnight, it's bitterly cold and it's dark so you can hardly see and on stage is a single guard holding duty and he's armed and ready to challenge and then suddenly you hear the cry out, who's there? And it's Bernardo who's turned up to relieve Francisco. But it's Francisco who's on guard duty, so it should be him challenging whoever turns up. So clearly, Bernardo is already scared. He's jumping at shadows. And Francisco, I think, is a little bit angry with Bernardo here as well, because he's left it to the last moment. And why is that? Is it because that Bernardo is reluctant to be there at all? He's so scared? And what is it he's scared of? Because he's not telling Francisco. So we already are getting here an air of secrets and withholding of information. When Francisco says, for this relief much thanks, for I'm bitter cold and sick at heart. That's the line that Bernardo leaps on, sick at heart. Have you had a quiet God? Have you seen anything? But Bernardo is saying, no, he's had a quiet night, he just wants to go home. But the audience will have picked up on that sick at heart as well. Is that a state of being for everybody in Denmark at this time? Are things just wrong? And then, before he leaves, Bernardo says to uh, Francisco, if you see Horatio and Marcellus, tell them to hurry up. He clearly doesn't want to be left on his own here. And then they believe that they hear them. And um, Marcellus and Bernardo call out. And when Bernardo says, here's a ratio here, you get this very strange greeting of a piece of him. Now, there's a school of thought that says that what this is about is it's so dark and cold, it's misty. And when Horatio holds out his hand and his arm is all that can be seen because it's so dark. And that's why he's saying just a piece of him. But there's another school of thought that's saying that Horatio is saying here, look, you're not getting a, a whole open-minded Horatio here. You're getting a cynical Horatio because I don't believe what you've told me you've seen. Right. Um, Francisco at this point has now gone home and Marcellus again is saying to Bernardo that Horatio just doesn't believe them. And what is it that Marcellus and Bernardo have seen? A new audience at this time wouldn't know. If you've not seen this play, you don't know the story, you don't know what it is that's got Marcellus and Bernardo so scared. Now Horatio just says, tush tush, it will not appear. He's mocking them really. So Bernardo says, OK, let's sit down while we tell you what it is that we have seen two nights running. And now this is a very clever piece of stage direction in actual fact by Shakespeare. What he's doing is getting the audiences to lower themselves to the ground so they'll be talking in hushed tones, creating an atmosphere of quiet tension. But not only that, it opens up the stage for the audience to see all of the stage. Now, the um, stage techniques would have been quite sophisticated at that time. They would have maybe created special effects by mirrors or by trap doors and trap raises. And here you've got an open stage for the audience to see the ghost suddenly appear. And if the audience haven't noticed it, well then you've got Marcellus. He strikes out and, and points out to say, peace, break me off, look where it comes again. And now, here you get the appearance of the ghost. And Horatio is scared. Yeah, yeah. And, and not only that, they say, does it not look like the king? So we now find out not only is there a ghost, but it's a ghost of a dead king of Denmark. And it's one that they recognise. And Horatio says, it hallows me with fear and wonder. Horatio's belief system here is now being challenged. He doesn't believe in ghosts. But it's a common belief at this time by many Elizabethans, most Elizabethans in fact, that ghosts did exist. And so did wishes and so did evil spirits. And it was believed at the time that an evil spirit might appear to you in the guise of somebody that you knew, that you loved, that had died, 
and you would be tempted away by them and led into danger, perhaps to fall over the edge of a cliff or, or to drown in the sea, something like that. And I believe that this is what Horatio is challenging it, challenging it to be, saying, what art thou that usurpest this time of night? And uh, they ask Horatio to talk to him because he's a scholar, so therefore he can talk to ghosts. Because it's believed at the time that to exercise ghosts you'd have to speak Latin, for instance. But Horatio's not here to exercise it. He's here to challenge and find out what it is. But the ghost takes offence at this and just leaves. So now we know that there is a ghost that's been appearing for two nights running, but we don't know why. But not only that, Marcellus wants to know why it is that they're having to stand guard duty all this time. But not only that, why are they building up the army? They're building an arsenal, they're building cannons, they're building ships. And not only that, they're doing it 24-7. They're even working on the Sundays. Why is this? Horatio says he believes he knows the answer to that or so the whisper goes, which again enforces this society of secrets and withholding of information. Why don't the common populace know what's going on here? So Hamlet now goes into a speech explaining what this is about, in that the ghost that they have just seen, Hamlet, who was the king, was challenged by the king of Norway, King Fortinbras, the challenge was that they would have single combat and whoever lost would have to give up lands to the victor along with their life. This was a challenge to the death and it was Hamlet that won and he won the prize of land which increased, increased the prosperity of course of, um, of Denmark. So we now find out what kind of king Hamlet was. He was a warrior king and a fierce warrior king, capable of, of killing. Now, but now we also find out that Fortinbras that's dead, his son, young Fortinbras, who we would assume has inherited the throne, because that's how things were done in those days, it was a linear uh, inheritance. In fact, he still is today. Right? It's the firstborn that inherits the throne. So you would assume that Fortinbras is the king. Now what he's done is he's got himself an army and he is marching onto Denmark to demand back those lands lost by his father. What kind of army is it? Now, Fortinbras himself is described here as unimproved metal, hot and full. And it is shocked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it. What he's got himself is an army of mercenaries. Now, if these mercenaries march down on um, Denmark and storm the castle, the aftermath would not be pretty. And this, perhaps, is why this information is being withheld from the public and the army at large. Now, Bernardo agrees that he thinks that this is probably the reason why they are doing that. And he marks also that it's a bit of a coincidence that at this moment, the ghost of the king that has caused Fortinbras to march his army here suddenly appears. And uh, Ratio agrees, yeah, this is a moat to trouble the mind's eye. And he makes references here to a time when Julius Caesar, the night before he died, how ghosts rose from their graves and walked and gibbered amongst the streets, and that there were blood trails of stars in the sky, and there was an eclipse. And this speech would create a whole sense of unease. And now let's not forget that at the time when this play was written, which was about 1600, the present monarch would have been Queen Elizabeth I. Now she died in 1603 and she would have been very old and very frail. She was sickly at this time. And she was also known as the Virgin Queen because she was not married and she had no natural heirs. So there was 
a fear of who was going to be the next monarch. Now the monarch before Queen Elizabeth I was Queen Mary, also known as Bloody Mary. Now she was Catholic, right? unlike her father who had introduced Protestantism into the country, she brought back Catholicism. Now the Catholics and the Protestants didn't like each other and when Mary died Queen Elizabeth I again brought back Protestantism and now there was an air of tension here who was going to be the next monarch what kind of monarch was that going to be so an audience at this point would have been very very uneasy this speech would have really touched on their feelings now, and then but the end of that speech is cut off because the ghost re-enters and now Horatio, even though he's scared, is determined that he's going to challenge it and torture it and find out why this ghost is appearing. Is it appeared because it has some crime that it's committed that it needs to confess? Has it got a pot of gold hidden somewhere that, you know, that Horatio could find? Or has it got information that could help them about the troubles of the times? But the ghost opens his mouth and is about to speak and then the cockerel crows and this is a great moment of tension it's a real cliffhanger here he's about to tell them but no the cockerel crows and he has to return to his grave and they try to stop it they're so excited by this now their emotions are so high they strike at it with their partisans but of course Marcellus then says come on how stupid can we be this is a ghost we can't attack it and it just disappears and then there's a change of tone here now they actually start talking about Christ and Christmas and saying how at that, that time is so hallowed that time that ghosts and spirits and witches can't walk and have no control over anybody and uh, Horatio agrees and says how he believes this as well what they're doing is that they're changing a real tone here because they've had a lot of excitement here a lot of fear and tension their adrenaline is probably really rushing from them and then you get this beautiful line this line has always struck me it's a really really beautiful line where Hamlet says but look the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the, the dew of yon high eastward hill he's saying it is daylight daylight is coming in things can change daylight by the way it's a magical moment certainly when you're outside in the wild it's a magical moment it's a transitional time and that's what this play is actually it's, it's set at a transitional time king hamlet has died there is a new monarch now Horatio actually comes up with a plan here and he says look I know where Hamlet is young Hamlet old Hamlet's son who we would naturally assume is now the king of Denmark as I said earlier referring to Fortinbras it's a linear succession as it is still today King Hamlet is dead so his son Hamlet will be the next king and Horatio knows where he is the next day and they want to go and tell him this of course Marcellus and Bernardo themselves they couldn't have gone up to Hamlet and said hey we've seen the ghost of your dead father they just couldn't have done that that perhaps is why they've invited Horatio along to do it not just because he's a scholar and he can talk to the ghost but he can also go and talk to Hamlet and that's what it is that they decide to do which sets us up now beautifully for act one scene two where we will meet King Hamlet and find out what happens next and I look forward to that and I hope you join me hello and welcome to the virtual Shakespeare reading group in this video I'll be talking about Hamlet act one scene two and this is a stark contrast to the scene that went before it Scene one takes place outside of the castle at midnight. It's dark and it's cold and there's an atmosphere of fear and menace and we have a supernatural apparition. Scene two, however, takes place during daylight hours inside the castle and it begins with a celebration of a marriage and a speech delivered by the king 
which is full of promise of hope and stability for the future of Denmark is not however delivered by the king that we were expecting to see instead of Prince Hamlet ascending the throne instead we have his uncle Claudius who is the king and furthermore Claudius has married Hamlet's mother Gertrude who is his former sister-in-law now in the eyes of an Elizabethan audience this would have been seen as incest the line is in actual fact our sometime sister now our queen but Claudius shows himself here to be an astute statesman and a clever manipulator of people and situations he says here how the um, court has freely gone along with this decision he says nor have we herein barred your better wisdom which have freely gone with this affair along so he makes it look like the court is as res much responsible for this marriage as he is without actually naming any names and deflecting responsibility away from himself before swiftly moving along to deal with this situation at hand which is young fought in brass gathering an army of mercenaries to march on Denmark and demand back lands lost by his father to the old king Hamlet. Now Claudius is actually quite dismissive of young Fortinbras here saying colleague with this dream of his advances and pestering his demands pestering creating an image of a petulant young child perhaps before going on to say that he has created letters to be sent to his uncle, the King of Norway, telling him to put a leech on young Fortinbras. Now, there's two things happen here. Firstly, we get a comparison between the two kings. The King of Norway is described as being sickly and bedridden, and he's not even aware of what young Fortinbras is doing, which makes Claudius appear more powerful stronger in control of his court but what it's also doing is creating a parallel between Prince Hamlet and Prince Fortinbras both of which should have inherited the throne but were both overlooked in favour of their uncle so Claudius has clearly come onto the stage with a well prepared speech to establish himself as the king of Denmark. Let's look at him just, just a little more, bit more closely at the earlier parts of that speech, which is in actual fact full of contradictory terms, contradictory imagery, with statements like with mirth in funeral and dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, with an auspicious and dropping eye. These statements create like an undercurrent of discomfort within the speech. Perhaps what Shakespeare here is doing is kind of creating an idea that perhaps all in the court of Denmark is not as merry as it appears on the surface. And then we get introduced to two more characters, Polonius and Laertes. Laertes is a son of Polonius and he is a student who has been studying at France and returned to witness the coronation. And Polonius is an advisor to King Claudius and Claudius here is very flattering to Polonius saying that the head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth than is the throne of Denmark to thy father Polonius. The head of course being the king and the heart being the court and um, what Shakespeare here is is doing he is pinpointing Polonius to the audience and saying that this is an important character look out for him and he is also saying that Laertes is a very important character he actually mentions his name four times in nine lines so again he is saying look at this character he's important and Laertes responds with his flattery to, um, Polo to uh, Claudius saying that he has returned willingly to witness his coronation it says nothing about the funeral and nothing at all about the tricky subject of the incestuous marriage and wishing to go back to France which Claudius agrees to then we are introduced to Hamlet now 
This introduction is saying our cousin and now our son. And straight away we get a conversation of conflict between Hamlet and Claudius where Hamlet's response is a little more than kin and less than kind. Cousin of course being a generic term for family member. But Hamlet's saying here I'm more than just any old family member. I'm your nephew and in line for the throne but I'm nothing like you and kind of course having double meaning as in similar to but kind as in favourable. So Hamlet's saying he clearly doesn't like Claudius here. And Claudius responds in saying, well, how is it the clouds still hang on you? Not so, says Hamlet, for I am too much in the sun. The sun, of course, being a um, symbolic of the king. So what Hamlet is saying here is, I am too much in your presence and I don't want to be. Now, here we are now introduced to Gertrude, his mother, and she interjects here, asking Hamlet to look more favourably upon Denmark, the king. Because after all, all fathers die, it's common. And Hamlet and seizes on that word common and comes back with another biting mark, remark. Yes, indeed it is common. Is he alluding here to Gertrude's marriage to her brother-in-law saying it's common behaviour? But then, then Gertrude is saying, why it seems with you? And here again, we get more conflict from Hamlet here, saying how, what he's saying in this little bit here is that everybody else is giving outward appearances of being sad. But they're not really feeling it. He's saying that these are all things that actors could do. But he is really feeling this depression. Now, I think at this point here, Claudius is probably getting quite annoyed and he interjects here and, and he, he kind of says to Hamlet, look, as your mother said, all fathers must die. You know, and, and it's right, it's, it is your duty to mourn, it's just to be mourning it this much, to continue to do so. It's really quite childlike, he's saying, and unschooled, and, which is quite clear insults to Hamlet. And, and he's, he's saying to him, what? Are we supposed to mourn our fathers all the way back to the first father that was ever in existence, Adam? Now, I think it's important to point, point out here at this time the age of Hamlet. I'm going to break a golden rule here. Where, well, I don't really want you to look ahead of the play. Just read it to see it at a time and then, you know, we, we, we can make discoveries as we go along. But I think it's important to note here because it will be clear to see by the character playing Hamlet that he is not a young teenage student. It states in the play later on that Hamlet is 30 years old. He's 30 years old and he's still a student, by the way. And by the way, at the end of this, uh, this um, monologue, Claudius denies Hamlet's request to return to Wittenberg and tells him he has to stay in Elsinore, the court in Denmark. Now I think that um, Hamlet here would have come back with very biting remarks. So let's, let's face it, he's a 30-year-old man, he's been, had a very patronising speech given to him here, and this man is trying to step into his father's shoes. But Gertrude interjects and, has, and asking Hamlet not to deny her prayers. And Hamlet's response is here, I shall do my best to obey you, madam. Which is saying that he will obey his mother, not his father. But again, Claudius displaying his great statesmanship here, leaping onto that and saying how sweet a reply it is and saying, now come on Gertrude, let's go off and have a drink to celebrate. And then we're left alone on stage with Hamlet and his first soliloquy, the first soliloquy of the play. Now soliloquies play important roles here. They help us to see the true feelings of the character. The character's real emotions are expressed here. It's not like a monologue or a dialogue where characters can lie or get confused. Here we get to see his true inner feelings and he's talking directly to the audience. And here we can indeed see that Hamlet is thoroughly depressed to the point of suicide. He wishes that his body would just give up on him and die 
He can't commit suicide because that's a sin against God. It says here, or the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. This sets the moral tone and the religious tone of the play. And Claudius also, sorry, um, Hamlet then also goes on to express how he's so, he just can't understand how his mother, who was so in love with his father, would get married to his uncle. And he makes a comparison between his father and his uncle. He describes his father as a Hyperion, which was a titanic god of light and education and knowledge. Um, his uncle Claudius is a satyr, which was half man and half beast, a lecherous creature. And then goes on also to describe his mother as like, uh, like Nairobi, who is a character from um, Greek mythology, whose children were murdered by the gods. And she cried and she cried and she cried until she turned to stone. And uh, Hamlet saying how Kirchhoff cries and cries and cries all the way into her incestuous sheets. And to Hamlet he is saying that this marriage is just a portent of the fact that things are not right in Denmark. Hamlet here is clearly obsessed with this marriage. It doesn't at any point in this soliloquy or right up to this play make a statement about the fact that Hamlet being the prince should have been the king. No, he just continually goes on about the wedding. And let's not forget the last things that Hamlet hears is, was Claudius saying, come madam, they're going to go off and they're going to have a big drink and party. And then on to the um, wedding bed. And this, of course, would be drilling into Hamlet's head. And I get the feeling that Hamlet would have gone on for hours with this soliloquy if he had not been cut off with the appearance of Horatio, Marcellus and Bernardo. And straight away Hamlet is so happy to see somebody because he's been alone at court here. He's isolated. His mother of course wants him to get on board to contribute to the stability of Denmark but Hamlet just can't do that and he feels isolated and here is someone that he knows someone that was a friend of his someone that he studied with at Wittenberg but straight away when he you know when when Horatio says he's here to witness the the, the coronation and funeral Hamlet um, said pretty do not mock me I think he's I think he's here to see my mother's marriage <laughs> and he's also had a dig at um, Claudius here saying we'll treat you to, teach you to drink deep ere you depart another dig at uh, Claudius's very big drinking habits but he also, he also says that the, um, the funeral cold baked meats did coldly furnish the wedding tables and the ratio does agree that in fact it was quite quick two months and I mean I have to say it's only been two months and the king has been dead and she's married Claudius and it has to be discussed here as well at this point. Did Claudius need to marry Gertrude in order to solidify his claim to the throne? My answer to that would be no. Because as I said, it would have been seen as an incestuous affair. So clearly, Gertrude and Claudius would have some feelings for each other. I would say that Claudius has very strong, passionate feelings for Gertrude. But Gertrude, of course, would probably want that security of, of a husband. And then Horatio has to broach this subject of having seen the ghost. And at first, Hamlet's response is confusion. What? But then as, Ham, as, as Horatio says, seizing your admiration. Whilst he gets his Marcellus and Bernardo to witness that for two nights they have seen the ghost of his father and Horatio himself has witnessed it. Now Hamlet's response here is to question them on that. So notice here that Hamlet is much more open to the idea of ghosts and spirits existing than Horatio was. He has a much more open inquisitive mind. and he, But he won't accept it just at face value. He questions. This is another aspect of Hamlet's nature. Let's not forget in that soliloquy before Hamlet, Hamlet likened, him, has likened himself in contrast to Hercules, saying that Hamlet is nothing like Hercules. Hercules being a half man, half god, figure of action and power. And Hamlet, though, is clearly a figure of 
a thought, a contemplation. He asks all the time questions. But he agrees that he will go the next night to see if he can speak to this ghost to find out what it means because he sees it as a sign that something is not right and he binds them to secrecy but they are not to tell anybody about this ghost and this leads us in beautifully into the next scene which will be act one scene three and i look forward to that and i hope that you'll join me hello and welcome to hamlet act one scene three in this scene we get a more detailed introduction to Polonius and Laertes. Polonius, you remember, is a court statesman and the chief advisor to the king, and Laertes is his son. And we also get an introduction to Polonius' daughter, Ophelia. And although Hamlet doesn't actually appear in this scene, his presence is very strongly felt, almost to the point where he virtually dominates the scene. And this is because Ophelia is Hamlet's love interest, which is clearly of concern to both Laertes and Polonius. It's really what the scene revolves around. We're given a glimpse into a caring, loving family as Laertes prepares to leave Elsinore and return to university in Paris. And whilst he's doing this, he's giving brotherly advice to his sister Ophelia regarding the perils of entering into a relationship with Hamlet. But on closer inspection, this isn't quite the family living in perfect harmony, but it is a far cry from the dysfunctional family unit of Gertrude, Claudius and Hamlet. And you could say that a part of this scene's function is to highlight that contrast. In this scene, both Laertes and Polonius say a lot and Ophelia says very little. But we can't ignore the fact that this scene was written in Elizabethan times when daughters were expected to be obedient and were looked upon as chattel. A beautiful young daughter from a high-ranking family would be seen as a valuable asset, a means by which political alliances could be forged between families by a marriage. And Ophelia does show family obedience, but she's not lacking in character. When she does speak, she questions and she shows some assertiveness. And this alone says a lot about Ophelia. We get the impression, judging by Laertes' speech, that Ophelia is younger than him. A beautiful girl in the bloom of youth. An image which is enforced by one of Laertes' lines. The canker galls the infant of spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. In this speech, Laertes is expressing his concerns about Ophelia's growing relationship with Hamlet. He believes that Hamlet's interest in Ophelia is trifling and has no future. And when Ophelia questions this, instead of offering her comforts for dashing her romantic aspirations, he instead seems more concerned with her chaste honour than her emotional well-being. Look at the line, Then weigh what loss your honour may sustain if with too credent ear you list his songs. My reading of this is that Laertes is saying to Ophelia, if you mistake Hamlet's advances as romantic instead of lusty seduction, you run the risk of losing your virginity and hence your honour and hence your value. And he also points out that Hamlet's position as heir to the throne means that he can't choose his own wife and instead he must forge a political alliance for the good of Denmark. He really does seem obsessed with the idea that Hamlet is using Ophelia as a sexual dalliance and expresses a very low opinion of Hamlet's advances. Let's look again at that line, the canker calls the infant of spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. The infant of spring, whose buttons are yet to be disclosed, is clearly Ophelia. We then assume that the canker is Hamlet's intentions. And the canker is a contagious fungal disease. Now, couple this with expressions such as unmasked impropriety, which makes Hamlet look like an, an unschooled, clumsy pest and contagious blasphemies, 
and you get some very bleak images of Hamlet's intentions. And this is when Ophelia shows some steel here, and she says that she will indeed listen to and follow Laertes' advice, provided he practices what he preaches and doesn't make such demands on her moral conduct and then go swanning off back to Paris and live the life of a carefree student while passing it up. And let's face it, we don't know when Laertes was last in um, Elsinore. To get from Paris to Elsinore, you must first cross half of France, then half of Germany, and then huge swathes of Denmark. It would have been months, possibly years since she last saw Laertes. And then he, he turns up to witness a, a coronation and a wedding, he stays for a few weeks and assumes the right to make decisions about her romantic future. Now, I'd find that very annoying. And then we get Polonius. And Polonius is often played for comedy effect. And let's face it, this play could use some light relief. Polonius is a notoriously over verbose character and he starts this scene as he means to go on throughout the rest of the play but don't be deceived Polonius is far more than the old fool his first impression gives when he first turns up he light-heartedly berates Laertes for delaying his departure and then he himself embarks on a lengthy speech giving fatherly advice which serves the purpose of delaying Laertes even further. Okay, it is good fatherly advice, but I get the feeling that Laertes has heard this many times in the past. But credit where credit's due. Polonius ends on an absolute gem of a line. To thine own self be true. And it must follow as night the day that canst not then be false to any man. You will still hear that phrase paraphrased in modern languages. And it shows that Polonius has a deeper perspective on life than he's often given credit for. And when Laertes does finally get a word in and get the chance to say goodbye and to leave, he reminds Ophelia of his advice and her promise. And the Ophelia's response to this is, "'Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall be the key of it." Now, there are those critics that leap on this line and suggest that it is evidence of an incestuous affair between them, something to do with chastity belts and keys and keys fitting into things. Personally, I don't see it. I think they're reading way too much into the line. But, if I see any further evidence of that as I look at the play, I will keep an open mind to discuss it. But what the line does certainly do is provide Polonius with the opportunity to poke his nosy park and nose him. He can't help himself. He's a serial advisor and he sees this as his opportunity to offer more fatherly advice. And he's clearly in agreement with Laertes concerning Hamlet and Ophelia. And he lets Ophelia know that he already is aware of Hamlet's advances towards her and of her reciprocation. And he backs up this idea of the value of her chaste honour and that she is chattel with play on the word tender. And he also makes it clear that his reputation is at stake here as well with the line, you'll tender me a fool. But Ophelia holds on to this idea that Hamlet's intentions are honourable. And then we get a glimpse into Polonius's more seedy passes. He delivers the line, I do know when the blood runs hot, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. And he points out the uncomfortable truth that men of such standing as Hamlet are given far more liberty than that of women. And he makes it clear in no uncertain terms that Hamlet is out of her sphere and she must not entertain the notion of a union with Hamlet. And in fact, she must 
repel any further advances that Hamlet makes. But what are Ophelia's feelings towards Hamlet? The scene gives very little indication of what they are. Critics often say that the actress portraying Ophelia must make a decision about this to inform the scene. But let me ask you this. What if Ophelia doesn't actually know how she feels about Hamlet? Haven't we all been in that stage of a relationship early on when we're not sure how we feel about this prospective partner? And true, it would be flattering to receive the attentions of a prince, especially one as athletic and well-read and intelligent and artistic as Hamlet. But perhaps, unlike her brother and father, Ophelia has the good sense to withhold her judgment of Prince Hamlet until she knows more about Hamlet the man. And this, to me, makes her far more attractive as well as alluring. And it begs the question of how this relationship will develop as the play unfolds. And I look forward to that. And I hope you'll join me on the next scene. It's a real corker. Act 1, Scene 4 opens with Hamlet, Horatio and Marcellus outside of Castle Elsinore and on the battlements, waiting for the ghost to appear. It's the opening of a scene that's full of anticipation and apprehension. Marcellus marks that it's midnight, exactly 24 hours since the opening of the play, and it's been a long, eventful 24 hours, and we're back in the domain of the supernatural. They will be tired and cold and at best awaiting the appearance of a tortured ghost. At worst, an evil demon. The silence is broken, but not by the apparition of a spirit, but by a flourish of trumpets and cannon fire. Hamlet explains that the king, his uncle Claudius, is still awake and drinking. And this flourish is a customary celebration of the king draining his cup. And this creates a contrast between the two locations. Hamlet is outside in the cold and dark, awaiting the unknown, whilst Claudius is enjoying the warmth of the castle amidst an atmosphere of raucous merriment and letting the whole of Denmark know about it. And Hamlet is clearly despairing of this custom. He says, this heavy-headed revelry, east and west, makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They clap as drunkards and with swinish spray soil our addition. What Hamlet is saying here is that this custom gives a very bad image of Danish people. And despite all of their positive achievements, this one flaw in their behaviour creates a reputation amongst the Danes as being a nation of drunkards and this is what they're known for and Hamlet cares about the reputation honour of Denmark but let's reflect for a moment here we've now looked at the first four scenes of Hamlet and in each of them Hamlet uses language which creates an image of disease and decay he litters his speeches with words like canker ulcer disease incest and war and this is just to name a few. This language illustrates the corrupt state of Denmark and Hamlet's all-consuming pessimism. It also reinforces a central theme that Denmark is decadent and dying. And we now have a speech in which Hamlet draws the parallel between excessive drinking of alcohol and corruption. And who is it that's indulging in this said practice at this very moment is Uncle Claudius the King. In Hamlet's eyes, Claudius not only demeans the reputation of Denmark, but he represents everything that is wrong with it. And it is fair to say that Claudius does drink a lot. When we last saw him at the end of scene two, he was preparing to begin a heavy drinking bout and it's now midnight and he's still drinking and he's showing no signs of abating. Now we know that Claudius has a lot to celebrate. 
But this is a time when Denmark is undergoing a change of ruling bodies, whilst at the same time having to deal with the yet to be resolved threat of invasion posed by young Fortinbras. Now is a time for level headed leadership and political stability. Is Claudius buckling under the pressure and using alcohol as a prop? Or is there something else going on in his personal life which is leading to this heavy drink? But this speech is also a dramatic device. It draws our attention towards Claudius's behaviour and Hamlet's moral stance and in turn deflects our attention away from why they're here in the first place to see the visitation of the ghost. And this creates a situation where Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus and the audience are all caught off guard and shocked at the appearance of the ghost. And we now get a sudden change in tempo as Hamlet believes that he is seeing the ghost of his dead father. And he says, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet. When Hamlet uses the phrase questionable, he doesn't mean dubious. He means inviting questioning. He believes that the ghost has something to say to him. Now, this moment has the ability to affect the audience on several levels. Firstly, shock at the sudden appearance of the ghost. Let's remember, this is the Elizabethan version of the modern day cinematic spooky ghost movie. Secondly, anticipation. Is this the ghost of Hamlet's dead father? And what will it reveal? But for me, probably the most dramatic element of this moment is that Hamlet believes that he is seeing the ghost of his dead father. A father that he loves and has mourned the loss of for months. If performed well by a competent actor, this has the ability to make all of us feel Hamlet's grief. But we also get an opportunity to see the reckless side of Hamlet here as well. The ghost beckons and Hamlet is willing to follow. And this rings alarm bells for both Horatio and Marcellus, who are yet to be convinced that this is not a demon that will cause harm to Hamlet. And they remind him of this. But Hamlet's response is, why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. And as for my soul, what can he do to that? Be a thing immortal as itself. Hamlet has an unshakable belief in Catholicism. And this is a central theme that runs through the play and has devastating effects on the decisions made that drive the action of the play. And in this moment, Hamlet does not fear death. And he seems to actively embrace the idea. He won't commit suicide. And this is a desire that he expressed at the end of scene two in his soliloquy. Because suicide is a sin against God. But he does exhibit suicidal tendencies. And in this moment shows a complete disregard for his own safety and indeed his own life. His emotions are running sky high here. And this also gives us just a small glimpse of how dangerous Hamlet can be when he's in this mood. Remember, Horatio is probably Hamlet's closest and greatest friend. But when Horatio and Marcellus attempt to physically restrain Hamlet, Hamlet threatens them with harm. Look at the line, unhand me, gentlemen, or by heaven I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. Hamlet is in such a high spirit here, he's threatening to kill them. And make no mistake, Hamlet is at the height of his physical prowess and an excellent swordsman. Nothing and no one is going to prevent Hamlet from following what he believes is the ghost of his dead father and he exits the stage in pursuit. And Horatio 
and Marcellus are so concerned for Hamlet in his current state of irrationality that despite their own fears of this unknown spirit, they too exit the stage to follow Hamlet. And this leaves the audience on an absolute cliffhanger. Is this the ghost of Hamlet's father? And if so, what will it reveal? Or is it a devil full of lies and deceit? We don't yet know. What we do know, as Marcellus says, something's rotten in the state of Denmark. And in the next scene, we get the great reveal. Act 1, Scene 5 is an immediate continuation of Scene 4, to the point where it could almost be the same scene. Where it does differ is in a slight change of location and a much more menacing atmosphere. And this is because despite the warnings of his friend Horatio, Hamlet is followed what he believes to be the ghost of his dead father and now suddenly finds himself alone with what actually might be a devil. Hamlet refuses to go any further until this spirit speaks to him. Up until this moment the ghost has either been unwilling or unable to speak to anyone but now we finally get to hear the ghost speak and when it does it presents Hamlet with a revelation so astounding it will determine the course of action for the entirety of the play. But before we get into what the ghost actually has to say, it's important to take a moment to look at how Shakespeare has structured the dialogue in the early parts of this scene. When the Elizabethans wrote dramatic verse, they used a poetic structure called iambic pentameter. Now, this has a structure of five iams to the line and two beats to each iam, the first beat being unstressed and the second beat being stressed. This follows the natural speech patterns of the English language and there are five beats to the line. Now let's have a look at the line of the ghost from this scene as an example. The ghost says to Hamlet, if thou didst ever thy dear father love. Now let's slow that line down so we can count the beats. If thou didst ever thy dear father love. This is a perfect line of iambic pentameter. But of course, Shakespeare will play around with the structure of this verse for dramatic effect. For example, in the early parts of this scene when Hamlet and the ghost are speaking to each other, they both contribute to the structure of the verse as they share the line. I'll illustrate this with lines two to four. The ghost says to Hamlet, mark me. Hamlet replies, I will. The ghost continues, my hour is almost come. These Three lines spoken by two characters make up one line of iambic pentameter. This is a dramatic device known as Stichomythia. It originates in the theatre of ancient Greece. And Shakespeare uses it here to establish a bond between Hamlet and the ghost, hinting to the audience that this spirit might not be a devil, but in actual fact genuinely be the ghost of Hamlet's dead father. And if this is so, then we can believe that what the ghost is about to speak will be the truth. It would also show that Hamlet's past relationship with his father was a close one, which would explain his deep sense of loss and mourning for his father, for which he is virtually ridiculed by Claudius in scene two. But Stichomythia also has other dramatic effects. It creates a quick exchange of dialogue between characters giving the audience the impression that something exciting is about to be revealed. And in this case, it most certainly is. The ghost tells us that during the daylight hours, it must suffer the torments of purgatory and then walk the night with no rest. It won't tell us the details of the horrors of purgatory, only that Hamlet would be horrified if he knew. Now, this cleverly leaves the details to the imagination of the audience while setting them up for the next big reveal. The ghost says to Hamlet, If thou didst ever thy dear father love, revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Now you may remember that that first line was the one I used as an example of iambic pentameter with ten beats to the line. 
You may also have noticed that the second line is fractionally longer, and that's because it has 12 beats. Shakespeare wants to draw your attention to this line because it contains some important information. It begins with revenge and continues with foul and most unnatural. And the final word which ends on beat 11 and 12 is murder. Hamlet then repeats murder and the ghost continues murder most foul. Shakespeare really needs you to pick up on this because this is the information that will determine everything that follows. And this begins with the ghost demanding that Hamlet avenges his murder, to which Hamlet immediately agrees without even knowing the details. Now, on the one hand, this will be because of Hamlet's heightened emotional state due to his meeting the ghost of his dead father. But it also shows the importance of revenge in Hamlet's society. And these are notions which will be shared by an Elizabethan audience who would expect Hamlet to fulfill his obligation. They love the good revenge. And then we get the details. King Hamlet was murdered by his own brother, Claudius, who then stole the throne and his queen. Hamlet immediately exclaims, Oh, my prophetic soul, mine uncle. This line shows that Hamlet knew that this apparition was a bad omen and that it was a sign that Denmark was in a state of corruption and that the centre of all of this would be Claudius. He's quick to believe the ghost and why wouldn't he be? This information justifies his absolute distaste for Claudius and shifts it up a gear or two into absolute hatred of the man. But it gets worse. The ghost has a long speech here with lots of information in it, but I want to draw you to this passage here, which begins, Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. What the ghost is saying here, that because he was murdered and died suddenly, he was not given the privilege of last rites, and this is the reason his soul is damned and he needs Hamlet to avenge his murder. It's one of the driving Catholic themes of the play, but it also gives us an insight into the nature of Claudius. Claudius is clearly a Machiavellian character where the ends justify the means, but to murder one's own brother and steal his throne and his queen and to do all this in the full knowledge that this would condemn his soul to purgatory. The pure ruthlessness of this man takes Machiavellism to the extremes. The ghost is bitter in his descriptions of Claudius. He draws comparisons between the two where Claudius comes up as much more the inferior creature. He describes him as that incestuous, that adulterate beast. Now, I'm not in any way condoning the actions of Claudius, but if King Hamlet always felt this way about his younger brother and made it evident, perhaps King Hamlet actually sowed the seeds of his own destruction. The ghost then moves on to his descriptions of Gertrude and he says of her my most seeming virtuous queen which would imply that Gertrude is not virtuous at all and he continues along this line of describing her virtue let's look at this passage but virtue as it never will be moved though lewdness caught it in the shape of heaven so lust though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. Now, what the ghost is saying here is, is in the first two lines, a virtuous person, even if they are tempted by a heavenly godlike being, will remain true to their nature, and that is virtuous. But in the next three lines, he's saying that by the same token, a lustful person, even if they are married to an angel, will also remain true to their nature 
and continue to pursue that which is vile and disgusting. Now, these passages, along with the word adultery, has led to the speculation that, Cla that um, Claudius and Gertrude may well have been having an affair. And there's also some speculation as to Gertrude's involvement in the murder of her husband. But that word adultery is actually targeted at Claudius, who actually wasn't married, so technically couldn't be committing adultery. Also, adultery doesn't necessarily mean to commit adultery. It actually means to make impure. But to be fair, Hamlet, so Shakespeare has in the past used this word to describe a married woman who is committing adultery in previous plays. So it does somewhat muddy the waters. But to my mind, the jury is still out. And I will wait for much more concrete evidence before condemning Gertrude. But now the sun is rising and the ghost must return to purgatory. And Hamlet agrees to act on this information. Up until this moment, the play has really been all about character interactions and situations. We now have a plot. Hamlet must avenge the murder of his father to release his soul from purgatory, whilst at the same time cleansing the soul of Denmark. And now Horatio and Marcellus suddenly turn up, having caught up with and found Hamlet, and they're dying to know what the ghost has revealed to him. But Hamlet doesn't believe that they can keep a secret and refuses to tell him unless they swear on his sword, which, of course, is similar to a crucifixion or cross, another religious symbol of the play. He makes them swear three times, despite the fact that Horatio is perhaps his greatest friend. Now, is this a sign that these are perhaps the first steps of Hamlet walking down a pathway of paranoia. Even the ghost is heard off stage demanding that Horatio and Marcellus swear to secrecy. Now this is the first time that the ghost has spoken to Marcellus and Horatio and it of course terrifies them. But what it also does is show the ghost's desperate need for revenge. Hamlet devises a plan to investigate his uncle in the murder of his father. And now here we have Hamlet remaining true to his nature. He doesn't quite trust that the ghost is genuine and feels the need to investigate. And this, of course, delays him taking action. You see, Hamlet has this innate need to question everything to the point where it inhibits his ability to take decisive action. And this is what critics say is his main flaw in his character. The plan is that he will pretend to be insane to cover his actions of investigating Claudius. And this has led to some debate as to whether or not Shakespeare has written Hamlet to actually be insane. I don't think there's a decisive answer to this question. It really is down to you to interpret the information presented to you in the play and see how you feel about it. But for me, at this point, Hamlet is not insane. He is clearly emotionally strained due to the loss of his father and his mother's marriage to his uncle, which Hamlet would see as a betrayal on Gertrude's part. And this Emotional strain will be pushed to its limits after his meeting with the ghost. The big question is, will the self-imposed isolation from his loved ones as a result of pretending to be insane, plus shouldering the burden of revenge, actually drive him into insanity? Hamlet is under no doubts as to the magnitude of, of, of his task ahead of him. Because let's face it, this is no easy task. Hamlet, to gain revenge, 
must kill his uncle. And this, in turn, would make Hamlet a murderer himself.